Thank you. We're going to start. We have much to cover. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have a little bit of a for sort of a formal presentation, and then we're going to have this conversation piece. So bear with us. I hope you find a lot of it very interesting. Um, so again, thank you all for coming and for your interest in one of the more historic and iconic structures in our town. Thank you to the Falmouth Cultural Council for making supporting this program tonight, and to the Woods Hole Community Association for this gathering space. Um, also thanks to a team of volunteers um, who helped us out to put this conversation on, and Arts Falmouth, who has been our fiscal agent for the past year. My name is Nicole Goldman, and I am joined today to lead our discussion by Greg Watson, Bob Moore, and Roger Day. We will present some background on the effort to preserve the dome that has been gaining momentum over the course of the past year. Give some history on the structure and the site, as well as hear comments on why we believe the time has come to turn our attention to rehabilitating this building and what it might become. We will then open up for discussion to hear some of your questions and ideas. Our hope in bringing us together tonight is to create a public forum and an opportunity for the community to help craft what we believe will be the best serve our town, our region, while preserving an important architectural relic. A warning, this is just the beginning. We have a long way to go before we realize any of these dreams. But the dome has been vacant and ignored for too long. And the time is now to come together and save the dome before it is beyond repair. As most of you know, the dome was created as a restaurant in 1953 for the Nautilus Motor Inn. And it is the oldest extant dome designed by Buckminster Fuller. He was here with students from MIT and some other schools to build it himself. I have some very capable historians with me tonight that are going to explain some of this history and background. Uh, but first, a few remarks on the rehabilitation effort and the vision that is being conceived. Many have wondered over the years since the Dome restaurant was closed as to what, it, what could become of it. Uh, as you may remember, there was a development in place about 10 years ago by Chris Wise that included the preservation of the dome in the agreement he reached with the Woods Hole Community Association. But that project, a senior living facility, was scuttled in 2008 when the financial crisis hit. My husband and I lived perhaps 500 steps from the dome. And because of our artistic and architectural backgrounds, we were always fascinated by the dome and understood its architectural significance. When we started talking about this with some people in town, we found that many others were also captivated by the possibilities of this space. And last year, before the ownership changed, we worked with the then owner as, um, to begin a feasibility study to learn about the structural integrity of the building, as well as whether the creation of an arts or arts and science center would be a welcome cultural addition in the town. Could the town and our visitors support this? We only got so far before the ownership changed and our work was put on pause. But while waiting for the new owners to come around, we set about building our vision and engaging the community organizations and institutions to join us. Our major institutions, such as HUI and MBL, have joined our nascent community advisory group and have expressed their interest in what this building could become and how it could contribute to the community. Community organizations such as the Woods Hole Historical Museum, the Woods Hole Foundation, the Falmouth Historical Society, Arts Falmouth, the Woods Hole Film Festival, and others have similarly expressed their support and interest in working together to make something special for our community. So what is that something special? People have long speculated about the dome, but no vision for what it could or should become has ever emerged with any concrete effort. Everyone wants to preserve the building, but what would be its best use? We will open up this to a broader discussion in a few minutes, but first I will share with you ideas that have been developed over the course of the past year among a group of people, some based in Woods Hole and Falmouth and others, including Buckminster Fuller's daughter, 
the Buckminster Fuller Institute and other architectural professionals around the country who understand that this dome is not only Bucky's oldest dome in the world, but it is uniquely connected to a town where his principles and innovative ideas have flourished. Not necessarily by direct process, but by the fact of how influential his concepts were and how that blend between science and innovation is borne out every day in our laboratories and research offices. While we do not envision a Buckminster Fuller homage, we hope the final version of what is created includes a permanent display that will teach people about his work. But the larger vision is for an interdisciplinary arts and exhibition center that will show contemporary art whether it be visual art, performing art, film, dance, theater, storytelling, art that embodies the concepts of innovation, arts that can capture the imagination of its audience, arts that incorporate science, technology, and the environment. The dome space is an inspiring one. It's 27 foot height and 54 foot girth. It's engaging in so many ways. The facts are that Falmouth and the Upper Cape have very little uh, in the way of exhibition space that display contemporary work. We have inadequate space for bringing world-class artists to enrich our cultural life, and no institution devoted to contemporary work. Our vision for the Dome of Contemporary Arts, and this is a working title only, uh, would create a place and a destination right here in our town. Initial studies support the idea that Woods Hole, Falmouth, and the region are a vibrant community that would be a strong foundation for such an art center. We have the year-round population and certainly the summer population and visitors that would make this kind of place a success. In addition to serving as an exhibition space, concerts, performances, conferences and meetings, and special events could also take place, providing a year-round stream of income and community gathering space. We envision having an artist in residency program, workshops and classes, their ideas for collaborations with the science school, the labs, the fisheries, all of our resources will be explored. Now, as I said, this is just the beginning. We are currently working on some important details, such as securing the site as separate from whatever development may go on on the rest of the Nautilus property. This is still in negotiation, but we feel confident that we will have a fruitful outcome, and with your interest and the interest of the organizations and institutions in town, that these dreams will become a reality. We're also working to establish a new nonprofit organization uh, until that organization can be uh, can obtain its 501c3 status. We'll continue to work with Arts Falmouth as our fiscal agent, so money can be raised uh, in our planning stages that can be taken as charitable donations. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I'll have some additional announcements in a few minutes about upcoming events in the next few weeks, but now I would like to turn this over to Greg Watson, oh, there's Greg. a longtime Bucky devotee, and someone who has worked to implement uh, sustainable development strategies with communities across our state. Greg is the Director of Policy and Systems Design at the Schumacher Center for New Economics, he is the former director of the New Alchemy Center and former board member of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, as well as a reviewer for the Buckminster Fuller Institute Challenge Grants. Um, and Greg will give us some background on Buckminster Fuller. pleasure for me to talk about uh, Bucky Fuller, someone who was a, had a great influence on my life, actually changed my life, and uh, anything that I'm, everything that I've done that I'm doing right now is because of my introduction to, to Bucky. Now this is a, a picture of Bucky at Black Mountain College in his office surrounded by uh, the structures that he discovered, uh, both defined and are defined by what he identified as nature's coordinate system. Uh, right from the very beginning, he wouldn't accept anything just on, you know, because it was the status quo. And he even challenged the Cartesian coordinate system and realizing there was a bit more to it than what we had been taught in school. Bucky was born in Milton, Massachusetts in 1895. 
and his life spanned a, a real sort of progression of scientific discoveries and technological innovations and really Im had an impression upon him. He could see how these discoveries and innovations could have a significant impact on the human condition. He wasn't a technological determinist, but he understood the importance of technology and the importance of us understanding um, where and how to use those technologies on behalf of, of all humanity. Um, following the death of his first daughter uh, due to illness, um, uh, and he kind of assumed it was because she lived in inadequate housing, it was drafty, it was cold, and, and he had not provided the kind of life that may have pre prevented her from dying. He committed himself. He committed his life to taking um, what he could understand in terms of nature's basic operating principles and his own initiative to see what a single individual could do that could benefit all of humanity. It sounds a little bit presumptuous, but that was his, that was his experiment and that's what he tried to do. Uh, would you mind just uh, see the next one here? Yep, so he talked about design science and I always like to say comprehensive anticipatory design science, which is a little different from the way that we normally approach problems, but it's the effective application of principles of science to the conscious design of our total environment in order to help make the Earth's finite resources meet all the needs of humanity. So it's really trying to strike that balance. It's a sort of balance between sort of economic equality, environmental equality. Next, please. Um, so in, in 1968, um, Bucky wrote Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And he wrote it, he said, because it didn't come with one. And we needed one. So that was, uh, and it was a really profound book. And this was a 19... 68, Spaceship Earth, um, and in December of 1968, for those of us old enough to remember, Apollo 8 circled the moon. And that was when, right, the astronauts turned their cameras back and we got that beautiful shot of the Earth. So the, the Spaceship Earth really was sort of became a reality, that we were out there floating, as he said, it, you know, all of us on this spaceship traveling 60,000 miles per hour, circling around the sun. We have no idea where we came from. We have no idea where we're going, but we're on our way. The Synergetics, written in 1975, is really sort of the, I would say, the technical manual for the operating um, of manual for the technical version of operating manual for space up Earth. It's uh, heavy on geometry, heavy on math, but um, it, it's sort of interesting. I just want to, it's you know, called this, uh, the geometry of thinking. But here's the New York Times book review. Just a little quick excerpt, real quick, and it says, um, you grope for analogy. So notebooks of Leonardo the opera of uh, Paracelsus, Pascal's Ponce, or, uh, or as Alexander Pope remarked, um, a mighty maze, but not without a plan. It is an alternately brilliant and obscure, opaque and shot through with moments of poetry. And the writer of this review was a guy by the name of O.B. Hardison, who was the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library, home of the world's largest Shakespearean collection. No one ever had any idea how to categorize Bucky. You couldn't do it, right? He's a scientist, he's an architect, he's a designer. He really was a Renaissance man, and we were very lucky to, to have him. Uh, would you mind? Well, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly now. Um, so he also was a father. Of, you know, if you read the first Whole Earth catalog, right from the very beginning, Stuart Brand says this, this volume, Whole Earth catalog, was inspired by the thoughts of Buckminster Fuller. Whole systems. The biggest whole system is the universe, but if you start talking about the ones that we have to operate in, it's the planet Earth. And Bucky realized early on that we didn't have an undistorted picture of what the whole Earth looked like. All the you know, maps that we use in school, the Mercator maps, you lay them out flat, and you don't, have, you know, they might be in the right, you know, roughly the right sort of, you know, um, relationship geographically, but you know, Greenland's distorted. There's all sorts of distortions. So once again, presumptuous enough to say, I think we can do better. And he designed and patented the Dymaxium map, the fuller projection, which was the most accurate description you could have. That became the basis for something he called the world game. He says, if we've got a way of looking at the entire Earth and kind of visualize what, what that means, he then undertook an inventory of the world's resources and trends and needs. And he said, this is going to be the mirror image or almost the, the counterpoint to war games, right? And war games, 
Military strategists have access to all that information. They know where the resources are. They know what's going on in the country. They know the political edit. And then they figure out how they use that information strategically to wipe each other off the face of the earth and perhaps the rest of us with it. What he surmised was what would happen if that same information was made available to you, 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 and me. And, and, and we could do something and look at this as a whole system and this whole thing was and remove what he considered to be the blood clot that, that distort, disrupted the flow of energy, resources, and ideas, which are the sovereign nations. Now, that may seem sort of utopian or hypothetical, but you've got to know what your potential is. Can we really do this? Can we, in his words, make the world work for 100% of humanity without infringing upon anyone else and without undermining the ecological integrity of the planet? And this is what he believed, and you can probably tell I believe it as well. So, um, next one. And, and it's important to do that. So, and he focused on what are some of the most important needs. And one of them was housing. And he did, he did his math and his calculus, and he looked at how long it took to build custom houses and, and what was involved there. And he looked at what was happening in the population, and he said, there's just no way. This is the comprehensive anticipatory part. There's no way that we're going to be able to meet the housing needs in the future. And so he was a bit bodacious and a bit you know, outrageous, and he suggested that we need to create a new industry, and that industry needs to be housing industry. We need to mass produce houses. That's the only way we're gonna be able to meet the need. So, you know, and again, but his whole idea was, rather than try to change people's minds by arguing or making the point, you've gotta create artifacts that new models to at least demonstrate that. So these are just a couple. This is one that appeared in Fortune Magazine in 1942 on a mass, was self-contained. You've recycled everything. Quick, I'm gonna go through this, John, so I don't take up too much more time. Uh, he, he also, not everything worked the way that it, you know, but you still have to try, right? Some things worked, some things didn't. But the Dynaxian car actually was sort of the, one of the first, I think, examples of biomimicry where you start to look at the shape, you start to look at nature, and start to look at the aerodynamics and all and say, can we, can we do better? Next, please, John. And that was 1937. Uh, this is the Wichita House, 1964, just another variation on sort of the housing piece. Now, he also understood that there is a lag in industries accepting and adopting new ideas, and the housing and construction industry is the worst. 25 to 50 years before they incorporate new ideas. And, and it, the, the World Economic Forum has just come out with a report talking about the future of construction and building, and they're saying we need a new mindset. We have to change, and, and in the last paragraph of the report, it said there hasn't been a significant change in the construction and housing industry in how many years? 50 years. Next one, please. And so I bring this to the geodesic dome. And if, if anybody knows anything about Bucky, you've got a room full of people that said, I need some, something about him. The one thing we probably have in common is the geodesic dome, right? So I'm just going to, and that was, a, again, a patent. That was in 1954. I'm going to kind of go through these real quick because they're going to hear more Now, you're going to hear about the Woods Hole Dome from Bob in just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to talk about the Hatchville Dome. And this is a, at the New Alchemy Institute is where we are doing some amazing work and we incorporated the ideas of, of Bucky Fuller and, and E.F. Schumacher and Margaret Mead and kind of put these together. And we were, you know, I think along with Bucky, we were practical visionaries, pragmatic visionaries. And, you, you, know, you know, some even say utopians, but I'm going to say visionaries. And this was the construction of something called the Pillow Dome, uh, new material, Tessnell, DuPont, um, uh, great uh, heat trapping uh, capacity. Um, John, next one, please. I'm going to go through these. That's a beautiful structure. It's elegant, um, really beautiful. Next, please. And it housed these incredible, right? We've got the <coughs> aquaculture going there, right? With the, the tilapia, we've got the, 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 the um, uh, vegetation around the edge. The, the very far corner there, there's a fig tree that fruiting figs. No backup system of heat. Again, sort of being naive enough to say the water will do the heat trapping. Next one, John, please. And we were, I was thrilled, we all were thrilled in 1982, the year before he died, Bucky came to the New Alchemy Institute to christen the, the, the Pillow Dome, and he was really sort of taken aback by the biological system. He said, I always envisioned that there would be living systems, not just housing inside my, my domes, and when he saw it, he was really, really touched. There's no question of, no, uh, about it. Uh, next, please. Um, this would kind of give you a sense of love this one, because again, the dome could withstand hurricane force winds, it was strong, it was durable, but as you can see, it was pretty lightweight, so we could cart this thing across the, uh, you know, when we had to move it last, and this is sort of my last one, it's just another variation on it. Um, is there one more, John? Yeah, so anyway, just kind of get to bring it to, to life there. But here, I think 30 people were ever able to move this, and I just use this to sort of make one of Bucky's last points where he actually referred to um, um, gravity as metaphysical love. 
Thank you. Next, next we're going to hear from uh, Bob Moore. Bob is an architect and an educator currently teaching at RISD and MIT and has spent the last year researching the finer details of this specific dome and teaching a studio course at a, a, about our dome at Roger Williams University. And Bob will tell us about the history of the dome in Woods Hall. I will. So, um, I was joking with Nicole earlier and with people outside that those are my bona fides, right? But those are my real credentials. But my the credentials for you all in this room is that um, I married a Woods Hole girl named Sarah Gaines. <laughs> so for everybody outside, I married a girl named Sarah Gaines. Um, and uh, I, it wasn't the last time I was in this room, but we had a really wild dance party in this hall <laughs> of, uh, several years ago. Um, we can start there. Uh, I'm really not used to having somebody else drive my slides, so Sorry. Jonathan and I are going to have a good time. Um, so, like, like she said, over the last year I've spent a lot of time, uh, that whatever time I can, um, digging and collecting and researching and, and trying to interview as many people who survive. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get as close as I can, Sasha has it, um, about the Woods Hole Dome. Um, trying to piece together as, as well as we can, the finer details of its history. We know its general story, right, which is that um, it was built by a bunch of people who showed up here in the summer of 1953, but we didn't know much. So that was the task I gave myself about a year ago. That's how I started the studio at Roger Williams University, where I asked them to, to do a design project on the dome. And then uh, I engaged with a, another colleague of mine at MIT and some graduate students to, to look at the dome from a structural perspective. And what that, that is all in the interest of, of one day seeing it uh, rehabilitated and reborn as something new. Um, you can advance the slides, John. Uh, um, so um, all that stuff is for a, a lecture I, I'd be happy to give you later, but it takes much more time than I have now. So I'll give you the very short version, which, version, which is that um, our dome is here. This is a photo of it from when it was built. It's 54 feet in diameter, and since it's a hemisphere, it's about 27 feet high. Um, when, uh, in, the, in the late 40s and, and early 50s, um, which is when this dome was built, Fuller was sort of acting as an itinerant, you know, migrating scholar going all over the country, like teaching at Black Mountain College, um, all the way west to Oregon, Minnesota, Michigan, Yale, Princeton, MIT just going everywhere and lecturing. So he would deliver a course where he'd stay for two weeks, do, a, do uh, lectures, and they'd build something, and then he'd move on. Um, and it was in that context that he um, developed, uh, <laughs> developed uh, and really refined his geodesic um, work. Um, and it's really, um, he gained a lot of notoriety for that geodesic work. And that's the reason also, because he was nearby at MIT at the time, that. Next slide. That Gunnar Peterson contacted him. So I'll go back. One more. That's Gunnar Peterson, who uh, was a local modernist architect who, in the early 50s, bought the Joseph Story Fay estate on Woods Hole Road. What he did was he carved the original house, sold it to the head of Hui, kept the rest of it for a motor lodge. And so he decided to build a motor lodge, the first one on the Cape, um, uh, in Woods Hole. And he engaged with Fuller to design the uh, dining room for the restaurant of the Motor Lodge. That's how Fuller came to be here. Um, uh, Peterson was, a, was an alum of MIT. That was another connection they had. Um, so now you can go forward. <laughs> uh, right. So um, for all of you um, math enthusiasts, it's a dome that's made of rhombus panels. There are two basic types of panels, the big one and the small one, and they're all diamond shaped, so there was rhombuses, right? And for you real math enthusiasts, they're hyperbolic paraboloids, right? Which means they're both, they're just curved in two directions. Um, and they're, they're all made of uh, locally available, very common dimensional lumber. So each of those edges is a one by eight. Uh, the struts in the middle, the diagonal struts are two by threes, and then the, the other ones are one by two flat. All of this stuff, go forward, fit into a truck at MIT, and it was brought here um, in July of 1953. Um, 
they pre-cut all the pieces up there in the shops at MIT in the basement. They loaded it in this truck and they brought it here to Woods Hole. Go ahead, John. And they started uh, assembling them into the panel. So they made these big on-site jigs for the two sides, sizes. You can see the big one here and the small one there. Next slide. <coughs> and then all of them are stacked up at the top there, um, waiting to go up and to be erected into the dome. Um, and it was a big sort of affair, right? All of these this dozen people or so arrived in Woods Hole following this truck. They set up a temporary dome, also made of wood, on, on the site. They lived in it, they slept in it, they worked under it. It was a real um, labor of love for all of them. And it was a real, um, uh, you know, the whole community came out to see this sort of alien spaceship land and start, like, assembling itself up on the hill. You can flip through a couple slides, John. So, what they did was they put all these panels together and then they assembled the panels together into the dome itself. And, you know, we talk a lot about, in architecture today, um, about self-assembly. It's a big thing. We talk about buildings that build themselves. This is a building that required no scaffolding because it was its own scaffolding, right? So people just climbed up, you put one on, you put the next one on, and, and then your, your building's done. It took two weeks to erect it at the end of July. Um, so, and then it stayed there for about a year and well, it waited for the rest of the hotel to be finished. And then July, I think, or sometime in the summer season of 1954, it opened. Um, and Fuller spent a lot of time here. Um, it wasn't just that he designed it. In fact, he really didn't do the drawings. He just inspired the people, the graduate student who did the drawings. But he spent the whole, his whole summer here. He actually stayed in Peterson's house. Um, and he was there on site every day, sort of encouraging everybody, building on site tools to erect the thing. Um, so it was a real uh, thing for him. It's not incidental that he, would, that he was involved. He was, he was a part of it. Um, and the dome served as, as the dining room for the restaurant. You can go ahead. Um, and so anybody who's ever been there knows that it's, it's just a dining room. So the round bit on the plan is the dome. Then it had originally a kitchen <laughs> volume on the right side there. So that's where everything was cooked and prepared. And then up on the top, there was an entry vestibule. Since then, the kitchen has been expanded and the entry was expanded to, to be a rather large bar entry. Um, and so that's the, that's the general plan of the dome. Go ahead, John. Um, opening day, or right before opening day in 1954, it was clad in mylar which is a clear plastic. It was brand new at the time. If they didn't donate it, DuPont gave them a really killer deal on it. Um, the whole thing was clad in, in mylar. And the whole idea was, of course, that you're up on this hill. You, can, you have sweeping views of Vineyard Sound, and you have views of the sky and the sea, right? So you're there, and you can connect everything all together. Um, it had a couple problems. One was that um, it was extremely tight, that plastic coating. So what happened was, um, it acted as a giant speaker. So it meant that any music, any conversation happening in there was heard all around the neighborhood, right? So they had to in, in, inflict the curfew on them. Um, the other uh, fact is that it was very hot. So they used this giant parachute and moved the parachute around to direct it around the sun. So it was uh, something that posed a problem. Go ahead, John. But it didn't matter because the mylar lasted only a few months until it was ripped off by Hurricane Carol in the fall. So the next year, go ahead, John, they put on fiberglass panels, which are still there today. Bicolored panels for the two rhombus-shaped uh, uh, panels, green and pink. And then it was uh, painted many, 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 many times with lots and lots of paint and lots of waterproof coverings to become, go ahead, the, uh, basically the golf ball that you know it to be now. White uh, covered panels with a few clear plexiglass panels on the bottom. Um, so uh, today, today, 2017, it's, it's a different case. Um, one more slide, I think. Yeah, so that's what it looked like in the fall when we were doing some measurements. We had access to the dome through the previous owner to do a lot of existing measurements, which I'm glad we did. We've, we discovered a lot of great things about it, which mean that um, it's, it has survived 60 plus years um, and it has deflected very minimally, um, which we were surprised by. Um, but um, sadly, it's in a real state of disrepair. The, the, for the better part of 20 years, it's sat there unoccupied and unused. And so that's our real concern at the moment, that we want to make sure that it actually doesn't cave in, and so that whoever's responsible makes sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so that's the history. Go ahead. Um, uh, you can go one more. So, um, but I want to just give a few words on its significance, at least from my perspective. 
Um, in retrospect, it makes total sense that Fuller's, Fuller has deep roots in Woods Hole because, I mean, he was born in Milton, right? It's not far away, but um, Woods Hole has, from the beginning, from guano to hui to MBL to everything we do now, been a tiny place that connects itself to the entire planet, right? So everything is coming together, and Woods Hole is a big part of that. And it's devoted to researching questions of great uh, import for humanity and our relationship to our environment, right? So that's why I think it's meaningful. Buckminster Fuller um, was developing the geodesic series, really, um, going all the way across the country in the, in the early 50s. And the Woods Hole Dome is chronologically interleaved with all of those important structures. It's right at the end of the experimentation phase and right at the beginning of when things started to work, right? So everything after tended to be out of metal and robust and strong, and this was like the last experiment and it's lasted 60 plus years. So firstly, um, it was the first permanent wood member dome built with Buckminster Fuller's involvement. Everything else was uh, wood and temporary or metal and permanent. So it's this kind of hinge between the two phases. So it's, it's significant for that reason. Secondly, this particular geometry of rhombuses that I mentioned is unique and it exists nowhere else in any uh, geodesic structure. Um, everything afterwards really migrated towards the triangular shape that you probably know from Epcot Center and, and Montreal 67. Um, thirdly, and, and maybe this is reason enough, as Nicole said, it's the oldest surviving structure that Buckminster Fuller was involved in and he was heavily involved as you saw. Um, so those are the real reasons, like architectural um, preservation-wise, it's a, it's a significant structure. Um, but for me, and uh, especially for, for me living in the world we live in now, what I consider significant is simply a matter of, of the dome's meaning, right? The Witzel Dome really symbolizes and embodies that uh, enthusiasm of that entire generation, right? All those people who came here worked for Fuller or they were sort of students of his, past or present. They just came, not because of him, some of them might have, but really because of the vision that he gave them or, or allowed them to see, right? A, a new way forward for humanity, one that married art, design, science, the environment, technology, everything sort of all together in this holistic worldview. And it's on that um, collaborative, uh, cultural, creative foundation that I think anything that happens to the dome needs to, needs to rest. So that's my two cents. <laughs> it's, it's a lot for us to live up to. Um, finally, we have uh, Roger Day. Uh, he's just going to say a few words. Most of you probably know Roger from his um, years of dedication to the arts in Falmouth and running Arts Falmouth and uh, many, many programs such as Arts Alive, Jazz Fest, Cape Cod Theater Project, and others. And so Raj is just gonna say a few words about um, art and the community. So I'm an arts junkie, I guess is a way to put it. Uh, and uh, my wife and I have been very active in the arts for quite a while. Um, I think there are three reasons why the dome ought to be rescued. One, it's to, to employ a technical term, it's a really neat building. <laughs> and I think it adds a lot to the community and would add even more. Talk louder. Talk louder? Okay. How's that? Yes. Uh, the second reason is I think Falmouth is a little sparse on spaces for uh, the visual arts. And I think that something, a building like this would be a genuine contribution for uh, well, if you think about the fact that Provincetown has 47 art galleries and we have one now in Main Street, Falmouth, um, this would be a, a tremendous boon, I think. And the third reason is tourism, which often makes us wince. We think of traffic and, oh my lord. But uh, without tourism, uh, this town would dry up and blow away. The only anchors are the ones in this village, but for the rest of the town, tourism is very important. And so uh, an object like this, used as a venue for all kinds of art, would basically be very appealing to what is called the, the cultural tourist. And the cultural tourist 
is a wonderful tourist to have, they generally are older, they're richer, they're better educated, they travel a lot, they shop, and they only meet the police to ask directions. <laughs> so from our point of view as a community, they're a very valuable, nice tourist to have. And that is what attracted Arts Falmouth to in the beginning, and uh, we're delighted to be here. Okay, so just a few more housekeeping things. Um, if you haven't already done so and you want to be kept in touch as to what we um, may be doing, please make sure you sign into some of our sheets. Um, in addition, there are some boards around the room that um, my husband put together. Um, just ideas on just the tip of the iceberg of the potential of what could be programmed into this kind of a center. Um, I have to say his interest in community, uh, many of you may have experienced through his Village Portrait Project, um, an innovative approach to sort of what does a community look like. Um, this is another piece of, of what we think the community can look like. Um, we also have a sketch here, and this is only a sketch of a part of the parcel that we're working to secure. Um, come and check it out after the discussion. And um, also, please mark your calendars. I hope many of you picked up this invitation. We're having a wonderful evening on Saturday, August 5th, which is a fundraiser, um, but we happen to have this amazing film called House of Tomorrow that's gonna be the closing film of the Woods Hole Film Festival. And it is a film that takes place in a Buckminster Fuller Dome in Minnesota. And it is starring Ellen Burstyn and Nick Offerman. And uh, it teaches about a lot of Bucky's ideas and uh, besides it being, you know, delightful to watch, it's, a, it's instructional. Um, there is a cocktail reception um, as a fundraiser as well um, up on Buzzards Bay Ave uh, from four to six. And we have limited capacity, but I hope many of you will come and, and be part of that. Um, all the guests at the reception, so they don't have to run down to Redfield, will have preferred seating. So um, again, I think it's gonna be a, a very special night. And, um, Finally, there's a notice in the back as well. If you're interested in how our community at large is developing, I'll be giving a talk at the Woods Hole Historical Museum on uh, Thursday, July 13th, about how we can maintain our village character as this area undergoes massive development from the Coast Guard, the Steamship Authority, commercial developments, changes at Hui, et cetera. Uh, that talk is at 12.30 in the library, and I'll also be able to talk about how the Cape Cod Commission is helping to assist Falmouth in um, planning for these changes. So we'd like to open up the discussion now, some questions, and get the conversation started. Um, if you want to be recognized, you know, raise your hand. We'll try to get to everyone, and uh, repeat. we'll try to repeat your questions so everyone can hear them. Um, please stand, give us your name when you ask your question. Um, so this is from Bob, stealing your words. Um, knowing what we do now about Fuller that the, these gentlemen have uh, shared with us and uh, the making of the Woods Hole Dome, we are convinced that the dome in Woods Hole should be rehabilitated. We know, however, that a project like this can't simply be about saving the dome. Rather, it needs a new and contemporary use, one that makes sense for the village of Woods Hole and importantly uh, embraces the worldview that made the dome happen. So, towards this end, we want to create this nexus for art, technology, science, and the environment in a place that can embrace contemporary manifestation of Buckminster Fuller's legacy. And so, we are interested in your reaction to this idea. Do we have a scapegoat? No. Do we have a volunteer? Any questions? There are plans. <laughs> Nicole. Another Nicole. Yeah, I'm Nicole. Um, also, uh, yeah, I'm Mike with Woods Hole Credentials. I was born in Falmouth. I'm an artist myself. And uh, my grandmother has a piece on Main Street, the sculpture. Elaine the scientist. The scientist, yeah. Anyway, so I have a question um, in terms of the um, how it would be run. Would it, are you considering it as a non profit? And would there be a curatorial, like someone who specializes from the outside, involved in art and science? Or what, what's your idea for that? 
So, all good questions. Um, okay. Um, so yes, it, 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 we are currently in development uh, to develop it as a nonprofit. So we're trying to uh, we're organizing and incorporating as a nonprofit, and we'll be getting our 501c3. Um, that'll probably take us a course of the next year. Um, with regard to programming, um, it's a very exciting part of, of thinking about the project, um, and that's where we need. It's very far ahead. This will probably take us several years to get to that point. Um, um, Jonathan has been working um, on conceiving some of the arts programming. Uh, Bob has stepped in. We have other advisors that have been working with us, so we're also organizing board of directors, community advisors. There will be an arts advisory group, and this is why we need to know who's interested in what, what people can do, and how they can contribute. Great. I think it's, I mean, very excited about it. Sure. Uh, Alan, is that? Sure. Is there an idea of maintaining the existing physical structure, preserving that at all, or to what extent? <coughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I knew this was going to come early. We, <coughs> we have had limited, we've had limited access to the building. And we had that access until late fall last year. So what we were able to do with our little, small little team <laughs> was to get in there and take measurements take, and take observations. So what we did is we built a 3D model of it so we can test it for various scenarios. We can test it for loads under various um, scenarios of wind or seismic, not seismic, but snow, sorry. Um, and we can also test it with different climates, right? Because the key problem with this structure um, is it's leaking like a sieve right now, but it also leaked a lot when it was under normal operation. And that's because its chief, uh, its, its, its chief acid is also its chief um, problem, because it's a very flexible structure. So it moves in the wind a lot, which means uh, it, it survives 60 years, but um, it means it required maintenance, maybe that was uh, required technology that hadn't arrived yet. So our hope is that we can just continue experimenting with things in a way to, as a means to test various scenarios so that we can keep it. I think everybody here would want to keep it, but again, the goal is what, of us coming together was to do something very interesting with this structure, to, to rehabilitate it, but to put it to a new use, right? To keep, to... I guess to, probably to the chase, I mean, is it a pile of fiberglass and rock or not? No, no, no absolutely not. No. <laughs> yeah. Good question. In the middle. Hi, I'm sorry to usurp this, but um, it's very important to me. About 10 years ago, my name is Herb Boyd. I live in Milton, about within um, a few houses of Buckminster Fuller's home. And I've been in it, and it's really spectacular. Um, and I was here with my family about 10 years ago. I went on the internet looking for a place to eat, and I saw the Nautilus. I said, wow, it's a geodesic dome. Let's go there for lunch. My family arrived to find an empty shell. And it was not uh, inaccessible. We walked right through it. It was really quite quite remarkable and it was you know just in so much disrepair and I thought wow this is terrible what is going on why doesn't the community support this structure you know and it was part of the uh, uh, the motor inn I guess at the time so I got in contact with the director of the motor inn and I began inquiries about moving it from here to Milton I thought what better place to uh, rehabilitate the dome than in Buckminster Fuller's hometown and I did a lot of background work and found that there were relatives of Buckminster Fuller still alive, um, some living in California, actually, and, and never having been in this part of the world, never seeing that particular dome, but very interested in it. And uh, everything came to a crashing halt when, through my state senator, I found out that if the geodesic dome was moved from its original location, it would be ineligible for state funding to rehabilitate it. And so that sort of put the brakes on everything. But there is, I think, that there are opportunities to get state funding for this. And I'm really happy and pleased to see this activity. So congratulations and, and thank you. Anything I can do to help, I'd be very happy to do so. Right. I mean, uh, the, the, the idea of moving it has come up uh, many times, but um, it, it, there are various issues with that. Um, but to your point about his family, so Allegra Fuller-Snyder, his daughter, who is pretty close to 90, um, 
When she comes here on August 5th, she'll be with us for that reception and that screening. And she's a remarkable woman in, of her own right, um, a longtime dance um, instructor at uh, UCLA. But she is uh, very interested in seeing this project move forward. Um, and we also will have the co-chair of the Buckminster Fuller Institute here. So there's a lot of interest from a larger perspective, Bucky perspective, yeah, if you right. will. Right. Yeah. Yeah, can you come forward, I guess, if it's possible? Thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Saito. Um, I live just outside Woods Hole. Um, thank you, Nicole, for doing this. I, I think this dome in the center looks like a wonderful idea. Um, I also think it's important just to talk about the dome in the context of the property that it's on and what's proposed for it. Um, which it's been bought by Longfellow and it's being um, proposed 29 units, condos, close to a million dollars um, for people 65 and older, or maybe 55, 55, 55 and older. So um, that, that's currently who owns the property and that's their vision for it. So um, that development's been discussed at the community association which I'm a part of, and we don't like it. It's too dense, it's out of character for Woods Hole, and um, it doesn't really have a community benefit. This art center would be a huge community benefit, but we'd like to see sort of what else could we do with this property. And so I just thought it'd be great to articulate um, what, what, what would be our fantasy to put on this entire property if we could get it, because why not? Like, let's just dream. And um, I Nicole, so anyway, um, <laughs> next to the dome, there could be a lovely park. Um, it could be a place where everyone could look at the ocean and enjoy the ocean breeze. Um, then maybe towards the back of the property, there could be uh, several units of workforce housing, uh, stable year-round housing for working families in Woods Hole. And then um, that's sort of the full stop dream it would take a lot of money and a willingness by the current developer to sell it. And then sort of that's fantasy A, and then fantasy B is try to carve off a half acre to sell at market rate to help finance fantasy A. Um, so that's, that's, you know, anyway, but there's, you know, grants for workforce housing and um, maybe someone's got a million dollars they want to make a park. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to articulate that because um, I think it's important to think about who owns the property right now and what's being proposed right next to the wonderful idea that's being talked about tonight. So, thank you. Um, so there are a lot of dreams and a lot of people have obviously put a lot of thought into this property over the years just because of its, its, um, its um, vulnerability, I guess. Um, and those are all great ideas. Um, we'll, we're not going to talk about the other part of the development for now, if we can, because that's unsettled, and I don't think there are specific uh, plans that have been put forward. Um, but we are trying to uh, do our part to work on this piece of it so that at least this part of it can be um, something beautiful and of benefit to the community. So I'll leave it at that so that we don't get into too much of a um, uh, discussion on it that's off topic. I just wanted to know how available the dome is from the developer, et cetera. Uh, the developer's here, but um, so perhaps we can, we did have it uh, available last year and we took several groups through and I do think that people would like to go through it. Is that what you're asking about, going through it or? Uh, no, how available is it, for, I mean, how are you going to acquire the dome? Well, th that is, that's what's currently in discussion. So we'll, 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 we're working on that. We, we wouldn't talk about this if we didn't think that this kind of support was important in terms of moving that discussion forward. Um, and so that's why we want to create a strong vision because I do think, especially by just seeing folks here, um, how, um, how much this resonates with everyone in the community and how much people want to see something that would benefit us all. It's so significant a structure and it's so important in terms of its provenance that we I think it's our responsibility in this community to do something with it. So. Well, I have a 
loud voice, how much land is there with Buckminster Full, with the dome? So there's 5.5 acres in the total development, and uh, we're looking perhaps to, if you go over and look at the site map, you'll see, um, you know, if we can carve off a, about an acre, a little bit more, that would be sufficient for the building, for uh, at least working with the footprint that's there now, probably not being able to preserve those attached buildings, but the important piece being the dome. And then of course we need to have adequate parking for such a facility, that would be critical in Woods Hole. And uh, so we're very cognizant of that. Um, so, about an acre or so, yeah. Okay, the second question, your wonderful idea of, of trying to buy it. What are we talking about? What kind of I don't think it's for sale, just so you know. <laughs> so it's a matter of, of, of working with the ownership. So but he would, I mean, what if one went to him with, is there a ballpark idea of what? I, I can't comment on that. No. Okay. I wouldn't be able to say. But let's see if we can focus more on sort of the vision for this space for the art center. So, you know, as we said, our intention is to create a nexus for art, technology, science, and the environment, exemplify the teachings and philosophy of Buckminster Fuller. You know, what type of programs does this statement bring to mind? You know, what would you envision? What collaborations with our local institutions can you suggest? Um, you know, what kind of vision can you add to this? Do you want, do you think you can come up a little bit? Thank you. I'm Joan Letterman. Most people think of me as a potter, but um, actually, my love is how I'll people. Get the too. Yes. My love is how people learn and how people uh, think about the future together and make a better world. And the way I'm uh, hearing all of this, and thank you all so much for developing the specifics, is that I'm in a conversation that's about figure and ground, and that we've been going over the figure. And the way I think about the ground refers back to a goal of Bucky Fuller's, which was the development of what he called comprehensive anticipatory design science. The attempt to anticipate and solve humanity's major problems by providing more and more life support for everybody with less and less resources. And I find that adequately touching me to really care about the project, but what would that look like? Uh, it could look like a lot of things, but one of the things that I'm aware of, um, especially in the Washington area, but it's certainly growing elsewhere, uh, is concern about equity in education and how the community college system is beefed up. Um, and National Science Foundation has the uh, informal education collaborative grants, they're all about building museums. But it's about who it all reaches. And so my questions have to do with what needs are fulfilled for the largest portion of our society and how it's moving ahead long term. And specifically, what are the year-round uses? And one of you know, my little pet vision for many, many years has been that Woods Hole could become an educational leader where we could train teachers who could go out, just like the baseball people training the farm system. Uh, so I'd like to see something, something like that expanding out to what benefits the most people. Thank you, Joan. I think that's an excellent idea, and that's the kind of programming that we have to think about. That's what we absolutely can do in the the quieter parts of the of the year. Um, education. It will be an educational nonprofit, so that's going to be integral. And if we can combine some science education and the arts, and uh, you know, the whole STEAM program that is um, really looking for. Um, uh, venues in terms of how to express, you know, those ideas to um, our school children. That would be amazing. So that's a that's a great idea. I hope you wrote your name down. <laughs> Nicole, I just had one quick question. Um, you mentioned that um, you're giving a talk about 
the sort of future vision for the entryway to Woods Hole and that the Cape Cod Commission is involved somehow in helping to think about what Woods Hole is going to look like as a lot of development happens here over the next five years. Can you talk about this project in the context of that, but also really what the Cape Cod Commission is going to do? Well, okay. So, so Falmouth uh, and all the other towns on, on the Cape, uh, we all pay into the Cape Cod Commission uh, for their services, and so they will be basically giving us these consulting services that are planning services, um, looking and, and have their historical experts and um, their, um, their, uh, their uh, development uh, people looking at how we can manage all that's going on. This is just a little piece of what's going on in Woods, uh, Woods Hall over the course of the next probably 10 years. You know, we have major developments. Did I mention Coast Guard and Steamship Authority and Huey and, and Historical Museum? Um, you know, Bob can probably speak a little bit more about sort of the modernist piece of this because this is such an unusual building and in terms of our village character and what we're going to try to maintain, um, this has its own particular vocabulary. Um, so I, um, I'm sure how to answer, um, you know, it's, it's a piece of it, but it, it's now part of our lore, it's now part of our folklore, now it's part of our village character. And I guess it's a, it's a good bridge, actually, between the old and the new. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it's, uh, and it embodies the sciences that are integral to our community. So, you know, all those aspects will be brought up. Um, they're going to look at specifically, uh, not only in the developmental patterns, but they're also going to look at pedestrian access, bicycle access, um, the, the view sheds that we have over Little Harbor or do not. Um, and, and, and I hope uh, that there'll be some look at, at and those, those aspects, the pedestrian, the bicycle, et cetera, will help to you know, slow down some of the traffic and make it look a little less like a highway because it is treated like a highway because it looks like a highway. And it is one. And it is one. Hi, um, I'm Heather Clark. I'm an artist and resident here for the summer at the Woods Hole Research Center. I'm doing a climate change artist residency. And I just recently met these folks, um, learned about the dome, and it's a complete inspiration um, to be here and to see this, hap this, this intention to make a contemporary arts um, center here. Uh, it, I think primarily because of Buckminster Fuller, and um, he was such a visionary for kind of thinking about how we can reinvent the way we live in a way that's good for humanity and also the environment. Um, and I think with climate change and everything that scientists here that I've been working with for the last um, few weeks, learning about what's happening, um, thinking about we, we have an urgency to do things. And I would love to see um, the center bring in artists that are thinking about how do we reinvent, how do we re-envision um, in a way that is really beneficial for humanity and also the environment. Um, and then also how do we tie that into, I, mean, I was so moved by the fact that Buckminster Fuller went to the New Alchemy Institute and saw the living machines and all, and, to, and that's work that's always inspired me. And to, how can we tie that in here and see this as not just a center for art, but something that inspires this, you know, Cape Cod and really the world to rethink how we live um, and how can we really change our built environment. So I love it and I think it's exciting and I, I hope this, this really happens here um, and that we can also tie it in with, with some of, the, when, we, when it's renovated, that some of those systems that were so visionary with, you know, John Todd, Eco Machine and all the work that you guys have done. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a thrilling confluence of, of all these ideas that, that are happening on what's whole. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I, I think this is just thrilling. So thank you. I'm Ruth Gaynor, I live on High Street. I vividly recall eating at the Dome quite a few times. I don't understand since this is a beginning vision where nothing's been settled, why the mention of workforce housing, affordable housing, 
uh, was kind of slept off as it's not, not on the table. <laughs> Why can't it be part of the vision since it's something people really need here? I, I apologize if I, I don't mean to give it short drift. Um, it's, it's not in our control, and so that's part of it. I wish it were part of the conversation. Um, we, we may or may not have that opportunity. Um, obviously, we do need some workforce housing in Woods Hole. It would be an excellent site for it. I uh, contributed just a proposal to the Woods Hole uh, Community Association several months back as an alternative for what this whole site might be, and that's where that idea came up. Um, so it's something that I do believe would be very beneficial, um, but uh, we have to see if the forces are with us or not. So it's not that we're not thinking about it, but it may not be in our control. I'm Ann Wittenbach, and I've been a summer resident of Woods Hole ever since I was an infant, and so that's been many decades. And I also think that if we're going to dream big, I think these are all wonderful ideas, but I think we should dream big and not close our eyes to the possibility of acquiring the entire tract of land. Um, a lot of these visions for education and the arts or sciences or both, whatever, that would be wonderful to have that land to really expand and make it a big center. And this could be the only opportunity to acquire it as, as a package deal. The other thing is, as far as a, a park, I think that's a wonderful idea up there too. Um, as a center for the arts, all you have to do is look out your window and you see a lot of natural artwork. And we don't want to lose that to development. And we want to be able to look out our window and see the harbor, you know, to see all the beautiful landscape around us. You know, that's so much a part of Woods Hole, what Woods Hole is. I think that if there's any way we can acquire the whole tract of land, it's to the benefit of everybody in so many different ways. So I know you want to keep it on topic, but well, if we no, can make it, you know, get it all yeah. while, while the getting's good, yeah. if we can. Yeah. I have to because I have the microphone. Um, I don't think it's off topic at all, simply because you all are here to hear what we're interested in doing. You're here to, to give your comments about what you think needs to happen with the property. So um, if that's what the community wants, hopefully that's what you'll make happen. And we're happy to work with you, frankly, to do what the community wants. Fair enough. Um, I'm Dylan Fernandez. Thank you, Nicole, for hosting this. I think it's been a terrific community conversation. Um, someone mentioned state grants earlier, and, and Nicole and my team has done a conference call on kind of the different grants available, and we're looking into that and, and, and funding available because you know, there's a lot of visionary ideas and projects out there, but it comes down to funding, right? And I think that's a huge part, piece of this. And know that uh, you know certainly when it comes to looking for state funding, uh, I have your back and my team will help out on that and also, you know, the rest of the Falmouth delegation, I'm sure, would be on board and supporting and reaching out for those grants. So let us know how we can be helpful. And then, you know, uh, as, as kind of a, a local example, I also represent uh, Nantucket and they recently finished the Nantucket Artists Association through a half million dollar <coughs> cultural, count, cultural council grant. So. Uh, the money is out there, you know, I'm not sure what the dollar figure is, but just know that we as a, dele as a Falmouth State delegation is here to pitch in and help whenever the project is, is ready to go forward. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. <laughs> And that will be critical. Um, one of the plans that we have in the short term, um, we're going to be working to get some uh, more money to complete our feasibility studies. Um, they're not just the structural, but it's also the economic impact, uh, what programs ought to be included, what, you know, surveying the, uh, the um, community. And uh, we'll be going for CPC money, hopefully this round, in, uh, there's an application due in August. It's very much on my mind. And there is also um, uh, the Mass Cultural Council Cultural Facilities Planning Grants. And so we will be looking at that. So those are important suggestions. 
<laughs> My question is very simple. You haven't told us where to send the check yet. <laughs> if you pick up, very good, uh, very good question. Well, thank you. Uh, on the back, um, you can send anything you want to donate um, to the, the Dome for Contemporary Art. You do send it to Arts Falmouth. The address is on the back of this of this uh, invitation, and uh, the money that we raise is going to be going towards our planning and development. Obviously, this is going to take us several years, and there are many. Um, experts and consultants that we need to get involved with it to get the critical information and do the right kind of planning. We, as I think somebody said here, we have an opportunity to do this once. Um, we must do it correctly and we need the uh, appropriate um, you know, funding in order to make that happen. So it, uh, my thought is just everybody in Woods Hole Falmouth gives 50 bucks. We're, you know, we're we're we're, we're half, more than halfway there. We're gonna we're gonna make it happen. And uh, you know, there are other communities um, that uh, do fund these kinds of projects with property taxes. Um, that's not unheard of at all. And it comes down to you know very small pieces that each uh, household ends up uh, giving. Uh, I don't know if we have the will there um, in terms of uh, the town of Falmouth. Uh, we can explore that. Um, I would like to get the town more involved. I think that this is something that will benefit, obviously, the entire uh, town. It will benefit the entire region, really. Um, so, good question. <laughs> can we have one last? Jonathan can say something. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful when you come up with an idea and share it with your wife, because you never know, it may take over your life. <laughs> Which it has for us for the last year. But I want to just say on the specific to what might be exhibited, as I've been showing these slides up there, and they're impossible to read, and you know, you can read them more closely up front. But I come from a special place at MIT called the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. It was started in 1969 by a guy named Georgie Kepish, who if you know your art history, he was part of um, Holy Naj's photograph department at the Bauhaus. So there's a real chain of, of innovation that carried over into this country. The people who I'm... Um, you know, talking about on these boards uh, are at that unique nexus already and have been, and there's a history of it already well integrated into the cultural, um, uh, you know, the, the culture. And so uh, that's the kind of stuff that I've seen all around the world from my friends who are these artists who are working at that, that um, nexus. And I think it is a very, very appropriate place, Woods Hole, to bridge this gap between the science domination and uh, a, a, an artist domination that also happens behind the closed doors and usually not as seen as the science is. And these, the, as, as Heather has just said, as an artist in residence at the Woods Hole Research Center, the first one, these kinds of collaborative uh, um, uh, reaching out are really important, both for building community and for understanding our world. So I think that we're in a very exciting place and all I can try to do is to give you the contagion of my passion about this, both subject matter and about the potential for this place. Because this place is inspirational on many levels, as our wonderful speakers have told us. And they fit within a historical district, a historical um, uh, milieu that is very important, I think, to the rest of the world. And, and many of these people that I have um, highlighted are coming from all over the place. And I think it's that kind of cross-pollinization that happens that new ideas come from. The Center for Advanced Visual Studies was a kind of an, uh, an, an intersection of itself, of that kind of um, concept. But it's very old. I also went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. 
The Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts had people like Samuel F. B. Morse, who you may or may not know was the father of modern communication system, Morse code, right? Well, this guy made his living teaching painting, fine art painting. So these crossover areas have long happened, but I think it's time now to sort of, in, in this historic science central place, to understand that creativity happens both in the sciences and in the arts, and it's time has come to celebrate that collaborative undertaking. So thank you all for coming. It's been really great to see such enthusiasm, and I appreciate it. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you for all your comments. Um, this conversation is not over. It will continue, obviously. Um, by way of a follow-up, we will contact you all via email. Um, we have some other questions about arts programming and ideas. This is a way for you to give us some feedback. Um, again, if you know, do not miss these two opportunities, um, the, uh, the benefit and the uh, screening of House of Tomorrow at the film festival, and I look forward. Uh, film? Yeah, tell them about the film. About I told them about the film. Oh, no, the clip. There's an actual there is a clip in the film yeah. with Ellen Burstyn on a sailboat with Buckminster Fuller. He is dressed in his bow tie and jacket, and he is steering the boat. And she is a young woman. And if you know Ellen Burstyn, she's been around a long time. And she looks up at him and she says, Bucky, tell us about the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.